Switzerland is going through difficult times, but your people have always been your greatest asset, and education has always been the way forward for this country. Minister Quinn has long been a champion of education and strong ties with the U.S. Everyone associated with the Alliance and the Mitchell Program knows that the minister has been one of our strongest supporters. It's also very clear that he's passionate about his portfolio, and I'm sure that what is best for Irish education and for making Irish graduates competitive will be at the forefront of the decisions he makes. We first met in 1996 when he was the Minister for Finance, and we've regularly had great conversations about the U.S.-Ireland relationship. I'm delighted to be able to work with him in his new role, and I have for him um, a gift of some cufflinks that have the salmon of knowledge on them, which is one of the symbols on the Mitchell Scholarship uh, rings, and I can only say that Ireland could have no better Minister for Education. Ladies and gentlemen, Minister Quinn. Um, thank you very much. I'll have to declare this now, you realise that. <laughs> Can I say to the nine Mitchell Scholarship recipients who are here today that I hope, and I think from some casual conversation that I've had with a small number of you, uh, that it has been a good experience. Um, I empathise with you because I was extremely fortunate. I'm, like so many people, Irish people in this room, the first in my family to have been able to go along with my siblings uh, to third level education. When I went to college in UCD where I studied architecture, going in there in 1964, I am very old, 10% um, of Irish people went to third level education, 10%. And it was determined by either brilliance, if you got a very small number of scholarships, in the main it was determined by income. Uh, we now have a target to get 72% into third level education, 72%. And we're on target. I think Green were what, 65, 66, depending in that order, and rising. And it's evident from what we get that the entry is coming from a much wider social spectrum than was previously the case. Uh, but I, I, I was a kind of pushy, shovey sort of guy in, in school, and um, led the first occupation of an academic institution, <laughs> UCD, on the issues of academic excellence. Our professors weren't up to the mark and we were paying good money and we were in danger of losing our international recognition. So I've been involved in education and, and incidentally most of the people who led that uh, occupation the School of Architecture in UCD, two of them went on to become professors in the same school, so uh, it, it didn't exactly harm us that much. But I was fortunate enough in 1971 to get a scholarship through the Ford Foundation and a man called Constantinus Doxiadis in Athens where I studied urbanism or the study of acoustics which is a modern Greek word which means the science of human settlements. And my first son was born there. Now, for those of you who think in terms of internet and modern communications, in cultural and linguistic and um, distance terms, there was no direct flight. Uh, Greece was about as close to us as Indonesia is today. And it was a life transforming experience for me personally in so many different ways. I was 23, 24, my first kid was born there. Uh, when we recently got married, uh, my, my, my entire world was opened to something that I had never ever envisaged before. And so having traveled that journey personally, and I can still recall it, I still to this very day have a great affection, a great grow as we say, for the Greeks. I've done political projects with them, great personal friend of Yoga Papandreou. Um, and when you spend an influential part of your life in a country, and things happen to you anyway because you're at that stage in your life, and you root them in the place in which they happen. No matter what you subsequently go on to do, that resonance of where I was when this or that happened stays with you. And so I hope that for you guys and girls, that as you go through a career, and you're already a success to get through nine out of 300, 250 applicants and rising, you're already there. When you start to move through life, just keep Ireland on the list of possible tenders. No special deals, no favours, just keep us on the list. Because what most people want is to get a chance at the title. After that, open the door, we'll make our own way. And that's one of the positive things that I think you can do, and I hope you do do. Trina and I, as you know from our comments, are, 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 
are good friends and old friends. She formerly worked with the late Senator Ted Kennedy uh, and acquired a knowledge and an understanding of Ireland, not from the perspective of the traditional Thatch Cottage Irish-American perspective, but from your own unique American perspective, which I think is invaluable. Because the relationship, as far as I see it, between the New Ireland and the United States is a relationship of equals. It's a relationship of grown-up adults, of citizens of two democracies, one very large, one very small. Unique historical and cultural links, certainly. But it's no longer the what we call the return jank, or the institutionalized Irish, uh, who sort of become passionate Irish for, for not just St. Patrick's Day, but for all of the whole year. And that's a kind of cultural ghetto that the Greeks and the Italians and others have found themselves in. And the grandchildren of those people have long since moved on, and we have to move on with them. And so I'm so delighted that many of you have come here without the slightest Irish connection whatsoever, which is in many respects very liberating, very liberating. And I want you to take that liberation with you and look at what the modern Ireland can do and will do. For example, and there are colleagues here in the room who've heard me speak earlier today, um, in the international rankings of universities, it's hard to get the precise numbers, but somewhere around 15,000 universities feature in these uh, rankings. All Irish universities in the Republic of Ireland, population four and a half million, all Irish universities are in the top 500. In percentage terms, there are more Irish universities in that league than you have in the United States. We all know your famous universities, they are iconic names, uh, but there are many others that don't feature. So one thing I would like you to do is talk about your own experience and say we're open for business. And if you're not fortunate enough or smart enough or lucky enough or a combination of all three things to get a, a Mitchell scholarship, yes, as Trina said, our universities would be interested in talking to you. Not because we want your money, although that would help, but, we, <laughs> but because we want, your, we, we want your diversity. This is still a very homogeneous society. And in social and class terms, it is even more more homogeneous. We're a deeply unequal society, nearly as unequal as the United States, but deeply. One of the most unequal societies in the whole of Europe. Uh, and while wealth and privilege are concentrated amongst those lucky enough to be born into that situation, talent and ambition and intelligence are equally distributed across the social spectrum. And it's getting more of that social spectrum into our society and meeting more with people like you who've come through in your own life, in your own way, uh, to where you are now. Because the cross-fertilization that happens, not just in the lecture room or in the classroom, but in, the, in all the informal discourse that goes on in universities, is really where the, the interaction uh, continues. And so I hope that you take a, a happy sense of your experience here. We're only as far away as the internet, so obviously those links and connections continue. Uh, and that you go back and talk about a different Ireland. An Ireland that's taken a big hit, largely self-inflicted, I have to say, largely self-inflicted. Uh, but if we, if we can do that damage to ourselves, we can undo the damage, of course. We're going to have a tough three or four years. Um, but for the first time, and I've said this and made it this point to some Irish student groups elsewhere, and it, by extension it extends to you. You are the first generation of Westerners, if I can use that collective noun. You're the first generation of Westerners who will come of age in your adult life where the West, starting in the suburbs of what is now Baghdad and moving gradually eastward, westwards through Europe and out through the explorations uh, of Latin America and North America, where Europeans had the effrontery to say that we discovered other parts of the world, as if the native indigenous cultures that were there didn't exist prior to our arrival. But since 1492, Europe, and by extension, the West, has basically written the agenda for the rest of the world. In different centuries, with cruelty and colonialism and exploitation. In other centuries, when you upheld values, and Europe is indebted to the United States for the preservation of democracy, particularly between 1939 and 1945 in Europe. But that said, the emergence of China, of India, of Brazil, of Argentina, of many other countries, 
is going to transform the landscape in which you will come of age. And therefore, Europeans and Westerners have to reconstruct a sort of contract with each other, a relationship with the rest of the world, a relationship of mutual respect, the reaffirmation of the central tenant of what we share in common, which is a, com a commitment to the belief in democracy and the rule of law, and to the constant repetitious cleaning out of the Augean stables, because we're all human, and corruption comes and seeps into the system, whether it's in academic grade drift or whether it's in the politics, whether it's in our economic and financial systems. And unless you have the process for renewal, and you clearly have it in the United States, and we are trying to learn how to do it in Europe, uh, we need to continually renew that democracy in the context of a different world landscape. So farewell, and fare ye well, and enjoy wherever it is you go to. But send us back fond memories, talk about us, uh, break down the mythology and the imagery that sometimes characterises Ireland amongst people who know nothing about Ireland whatsoever, because you have been here, and hopefully you've enjoyed your place, and I hope that you enjoy and prosper in the next place to which you go. I wish you all, all the best in the rest of your life. Thank you very much.